What's going on, everyone? This is Brian Turner here. Season five podcast season. Um, as you guys know, every season I like to do a different theme. The first season was a pilot. Second season was a, a all women guest list. Third was a black excellence. Fourth entrepreneurs. And now season five, we have coaches. Um, I really, it's been a while since we've gotten this, the, the, this season underway from the past one. I was really trying to do some work to get some big name guests. Um, today, we're lucky enough to be joined by JP, John Pascarella Sr., who is an assistant coach with Forward Madison. JP, how's it going, man? I'm doing great, Brian. And I didn't realize this was your fifth year with the podcast. So congratulations. Thank That's you. That's fantastic to hear. Thank you. Um, yeah, a little, a little background. So I was connected with JP through a season one podcast guest, actually, Darren, um, who was playing under JP uh, when he was an assistant here at Sporting. Uh, I've been kind of talking to Darren on how I wanted to get into the pro game. Uh, he mentioned you being a, a good person to, to connect with. Um, JP, I don't know, it's been, what, maybe two years, three years or so mm -hmm. um, that we've known each other. And um, since then, you've had uh, a few different, a uh, few different jobs. But now you're landed for Madison. Um, my friend Ian, who is another podcast guest, is friends with your head coach. So we're supposed to be coming up there later this month or August. Um, so excited for that. So JP, how's the uh, how's the season going? You you said we're we're able to chat today because you have a match tonight. Is that correct? Yep. That's, that's right. We do have a match tonight. It's not a league game. Uh, it's an exhibition game against the second division team from Mexico. It is Pumas reserve team. They're called Pumas Tabasco and they play in the Liga Expansion. Uh, Expansion. Okay. Um, so not Liga MX. The quality, <coughs> having watched a few of their games, is quite good. Um, their speed of play is different than what we're used to here in our league. Yeah. So it will be an interesting game of contrasts in terms of who can kind of dominate the way they want to play and impose right. their style and their will in the game. So it's always interesting from that perspective. It's also a little nervy because we have a big game on Tuesday in the league at mm -hmm. home against uh, Omaha, and you want to keep everybody healthy and fit between now and then. So yeah. we'll probably play everybody a little bit tonight, use some of it for fitness for some guys, use other – for other guys, it'll just be a matter of just being sharp and, and, and ticking, ticking over. Um, yeah. But yeah, so we play tonight again, and uh, the team in general has been doing okay over the last uh, four to six weeks. That's cool. And, and I think that's, it's kind of cool you see a theme where, uh, you know, you're playing a team from Mexico second division. You've got a lot of now European clubs that are coming in town that are playing second division teams. I think it was Barcelona took on Inter Miami's second team. Mm -hmm. You got Chelsea taking on um, someone this weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got a, a few games tonight with DC United's reserve teams and all mm -hmm. that. So it's cool now that the U.S. is starting to get, you know, some some credibility at least where, you know, other countries are wanting to come here. And although it's still preseason for them and, you know, they're just trying to get the wheels going, uh, the fact that they're coming here instead of just staying in Europe, I think is pretty cool. I think it's an ideal scenario for them when they come over here because number one, they're, it's less likely that they're recognized and known. So yeah. their ability to get out in their free time and just shop or do whatever and relax, I think is important to them. Yeah. We have phenomenal facilities here. For sure. They come at the perfect time of year. So they could go East Coast, they could go West Coast, they could go Midwest, they can travel around between them. Although when they do that, they realize that's not so easy. Yeah, the foreign players right. that come over here and play in yep. MLS in the USL realize travel within the U.S. is not, not that easy yeah. compared to the European or South American leagues. But I think this place offers them, this country <clears throat> offers them things that, yes, they could do in Europe, but it gives them different competition. Mm. It's a more relaxed, laid back in terms of their time off of the field um, so that they can kind of recuperate and regenerate their brains and everything else that's going on. And at the same time, the facilities are so good and there's so many good stadiums and teams to play in and against that it's just worthwhile for them to come here. Ideal situation, huh? Yeah. Cool. Well, well, JP, let's kind of jump into things. Um, 
I don't know if anyone can tell from, from back home, and I say back home being South Jersey, uh, as JP is from, but you can tell by the accent a little bit, at least I can, that uh, he's a South Jersey guy, Penn State grad. Um, kind of talk to us. How did you get involved with playing? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about these opportunities now in the U.S. with, kind of, with, with European teams and South American teams coming here, but it wasn't always like that. So when you were no. starting off – how did that how did that get into you know how did you get into it it's an interesting question because it was so different than it is now you can go and move anywhere now my kids have moved with me all over the country mm. and they just jump into the next volleyball league or the next soccer league that's in the area or the next academy that's in that area whatever yeah. it happens to be whereas with me as a kid when i first played i was lucky enough that both of my parents uh, were straight off the boat from italy mm-hmm. so there was that influence there And then it just so happened that when I was turning eight years old, they were starting the league in my hometown. And there was no way that league was starting without my dad putting me in that league. So that's just kind of the way it happened. And it was interesting looking back on it now because, you know, I loved South Jersey and it was home and everything about it was comfortable. But you realize how lucky you were to be in South Jersey or anywhere in New Jersey at that time, because it was very full of ethnic soccer people. Everybody I grew up playing with was German, Irish, Scottish, um, Polish. Uh, Did I mention German already? I mean, it was just, if you just kind of went through the blocks and through the neighborhoods, all of the kids that were playing were all descendants of immigrant families that had come over. And so it was rich with this football fanaticism that didn't exist in every part of the country. Mm -hmm. I know having lived in Kansas City and worked there, having worked in Oklahoma City, being here in Madison, it wasn't necessarily the case here. Some places had it because of the old NASL. Minnesota had it a little bit because of the old Minnesota kicks. New York, New Jersey had it because of the Philadelphia Fury and the New York Cosmos. But there's so many areas of the country that didn't have that back then. So I was very lucky to first be playing with my father. Yeah. And then by eight years old to be playing in the when the league first started in my hometown and just at a lucky time in New Jersey when the players at that time, same birth year, Glenn Carbonera, Tab Ramos, John Harks, Peter Vermees. I mean, these were guys that ended up being teammates or colleagues along the way right. as you're going through club and high school on your way to, to playing college in college. Pro, so, yeah. It was a great era for New Jersey. It was a great place to be. Um, Still seems to be the same way. It's just that the rest of the country, thank goodness, is catching up with it. So there are still these ethnic pockets, but now you see it everywhere in the country. You see it in in most every city that you go to, that soccer is a big deal. Maybe not at the professional level in every city, but at least in the youth level. But definitely at the youth level. Definitely Definitely at the youth level. Um, And I think... I think that bodes well for us in the country <clears throat> because when I was growing up, the adults didn't have a relationship with the game. Right, right. Now, the kids that grew up with me, they aren't playing professionally, they aren't coaching professionally, but were steeped in the game at a level where it was, it just kind of engulfed them because of the ethnicity around it and the passion around it and all that. These people have now grown up to be vice presidents, CEOs of mm. different companies that when they're making decisions about where to put their investment dollars or where to put their sponsorship or marketing dollars, some of that now is going into soccer right? as opposed right. to all the other sports because right. they've now grown up with that experience. That's yep. what's so good about seeing it at such a massive level at the youth level with right. the youth game. That's right. why that's, that piece is so important. That will eventually, in my opinion, help catch the fire for the professional game because it will allow those people that have grown up with the game and influenced by the game and have a passion for the game to help make decisions that better the game and push the game forward in the future. Yep. Well, and I think that's, that's huge, right? And, you know, our country with just the means of resources has the ability for youth sports and basketball and football and baseball and hockey and lacrosse, soccer, field, you know, you name it, we can do it and we, we are doing it. 
Um, but with that, I think comes more competition, right? Where mm -hmm. now the best athlete might not just shoot soccer because it's the only sport, right? You have mm -hmm. obviously basketball and football and baseball yep. that have the dollar amounts, but yep. um, I definitely think as the game continues to grow, right? And, and as you said, the, the money is being able to be put back in and where maybe now club fees aren't 3000 a year. Now mm -hmm. maybe it's a little less, or now maybe there's academies that have other teams that they can bring in that maybe aren't getting the full academy treatment, but they don't have to pay those club fees and they're still getting kind yes. of similar proper training as the academy team is. And, you know, yes. just all, all different things that I think can, as you said, help grow the game and help yeah. us bridge that gap that separates us from our South American uh, uh, neighbors and European counterparts. No Stress Midwest has partnered with mobile app DNA Soccer Lab to bring not only our expertise and training for field players to video, but also offering keeper training, sports performance work, strength and conditioning, player development, and mental performance videos to all of our athletes wanting to take their training to the next level. We even have personal development plans that we can create for those trainees. Visit more on our website at nostressmidwest.com backslash DNA Soccer Lab to read more. Yeah, yeah. It makes the game more accessible. When you break down the barriers of finances, yep. it makes the game more accessible to everyone. Yeah. And that's the key. Yep. If you only had uh, middle class Americans that could afford to play on a team, then you're only going to have a segment of the population. We don't want a segment of it. We want all of it or as much of it as we can get exposed to the game yeah whether they turn into pros or whether they turn into ceos of companies are irrelevant it's as important as they're they experience the game correct yep as long as they're contributing to the game yeah um so okay so we uh, you you had a, a 10 10 year pro playing career right and mm -hmm. you kind of transition i don't want to spend too much time talking about the playing as much as mm -hmm. i want to talk about the coaching aspect of it but Kind of talk to me about that maybe end of your playing career when that transition was coming into coaching. Um, I, I was talking to Jim Curran yesterday and he made a statement that, you know, no, no one's playing career typically ends in the way that they want it to or when they want it to. Uh, so kind of talk to us about maybe when it clicked that you wanted to be a coach and did you spend kind of the last few years working on a way to end up in a place where you could coach or did you just kind of fall into coaching? Just kind of fell into it. As I was going through my playing career, I loved it. I enjoyed mm. it. And I was lucky enough to play under some very good coaches that in hindsight had a very strong and positive influence on me, but I had no idea that I would coach. I didn't have a passion for it when I was playing. I didn't study it. I didn't take my coaching licenses. I didn't do any of that stuff while I was playing. What I was doing was I was lining up my next career, which was in the fitness industry. My degree was in exercise physiology and I was working in health clubs, whether they were uh, nationally branded clubs or independently owned clubs or YMCAs. I always worked in that industry anywhere in the country that I was. Even when I was playing with the Galaxy in 96 and 97, I helped run the downtown Ketchum YMCA, which is what was at the time, I don't know if it still is, the largest corporate YMCA in the country. And it was a great business experience, but it also gave me something outside the game to be proud of and to work on and right, to, and to right. hone my skills. Yep. So when I ended the game, much like many of the players who are told, okay, you're now too old, too slow, too whatever. When I ended the game, I was investing all of my time full time in the fitness industry and working for Bally's in the DC market. I had the second largest club in the market that I was running and managing, and I was fairly successful there. And out of the blue, Sasha Shirovsky approached me and asked me if I would be interested in coaching. He said he'd heard a little bit about me, knew a little bit about my background from some of his colleagues, and asked me if I had any interest in it. And to be honest with you, when I first answered him, it was a very abrupt no, no interest whatsoever. Yeah. But we kept speaking for about the next seven, eight, nine months. And eventually my wife said to me, maybe you should try it. Maybe this is something that down the road, you won't have an opportunity to do again. And you may kick yourself in the ass for never having tried. Yeah. So I told Sasha I would do it for a year. I gave him a one year commitment and said, I'll try it for a year and we'll see what happens. 
In the meantime, the people at Bally's weren't very happy about it. Sure. One thing led to another and I started really falling in love with it as, as, as I was doing it. And I decided that was the way I wanted to go. And I walked away from Bally's. I walked away from that other career in that other industry. Mm -hmm. And so I was essentially, essentially Mr. Mom, because we were just starting to have kids with my playing career done. I was staying at home with the kids during the day. And I started to coach in the evenings, whether it was at Maryland. And then after a couple of years at Maryland, it was high school teams, club teams, ODP teams, because I had just fallen in love with playing, I right. mean, with coaching. Right. And as that started to develop, I started to go down the route of licensing, uh, making sure that I could get as much education around teaching and teaching pedagogy and coaching licenses and that type of stuff. And then I also realized some of the kids, this really matters. Some of the kids really care about this, Yeah. but I want almost everybody to care about it as much as I do. So I realized that for that to happen, I'm going to have to get back into the pro game. So I started to reconnect with people that I knew in the pro game. I started to continue to go down the road of licensing. I went to Europe and ended up doing my UEFA A license in Europe and got that, which kind of set me apart at the time from a lot of the American coaches right. that were working here. And that was helpful in me finally getting my foot in the door, which incidentally was at Kansas City. Um, and then absolutely have loved the run professionally since then. But everything about coaching has turned me on and I've really enjoyed it Yeah. without ever expecting that to be the case as a player. Hell, I could barely be responsible for myself right, as a right. player. Now, one of the things I enjoy the most is helping others grow into that responsibility and helping be responsible for a team and to create a culture and mold men out of not boys, but, you know, young men. Right. Into older, more mature men, right. young and experienced professionals into ma mature, solid professionals. So that that process, I really, really enjoy a lot more than I ever thought I would. That, that's cool. And, and I think it's, it's very interesting to hear people's stories on kind of how they they got into coaching. Right. And, you know, you, you do have the people that as players, I mean, you've played with some of them where you can just tell like, yo, this guy's going to be a coach. You know, the yeah. way they the way they carry themselves, the way they see things, the way they're, you know, yeah. understanding what coach is saying, um, you know, but then there's always the people that you're just like, wait, this guy started coaching and like, Shit, he couldn't <laughs> even pay attention when, you know, when we were standing there. Yeah. Um, so, no, that that's cool. Um, so what is some like advice? Right. I, I know you, you've done the youth levels. You've had your span with um, MLS uh usl championship usl league one usl league two um looking back on it what's some advice that maybe you wish you would have received and then what's some advice that you would give a young coach um that's mm -hmm. maybe falling in love with the game or, or with coaching or maybe wanting to get into coaching maybe take it a little more serious yeah you, uh, you, in your question, you said, looking back, what do you think, blah, blah, blah. I think that's the key, is looking back. It's reflecting on mm -hmm. lessons you learned as a player mm -hmm. and not forgetting how you felt in certain moments. With that, I think it's reflecting on not, I wouldn't say, because you could drive yourself crazy with it, not every single dialogue that you have during the day with your players or your staff but you need to reflect on the things that happen throughout the day. You need to reflect on your training session. And did the session bring out the things that you wanted? Did the players take from it what you thought they would take from it? Because sometimes you <coughs> can teach something and they don't always necessarily learn the thing you're trying to teach. Yep. So yep. the only way to, to kind of reconcile that is to reflect back on it almost immediately, like that same day or same night and think, okay, what went well, what didn't? And I wish someone had told me that years ago. I wish someone had said to me, take the time after every session, after every interaction with a player, after every negative interaction with a referee, reflect on it and see how you could have handled it differently. What could you have said differently that would have given you an even more positive outcome? Or you had a negative outcome? Why? Was it the tone in your voice? Was it your, was it your inflection? Was it the way you... Um, just charged into the conversation without prefacing it. There's yeah. all those things that until you go through it, 
are hard to know and to learn and to understand. Those are experience-based things. But the only way to gain the experience isn't to go through them. It's to go through them and then reflect on them and take something from them. So when you say looking back, that's the answer to the question. For me, it's about looking back and learning as much as you can from what you've done or others have done in the past to be able to use it the next time or maybe recognize those scenarios earlier the next time so that maybe it doesn't go down a road that is quite as bad as the last one that you went down. You may be able to circumvent that a little bit and find a different path to take that leads to a better outcome. So it's yeah. for me, it's, it, I wish someone had told me to reflect on it. And, and my advice to others would be everything you're doing with your coaching, youth coaching, licensing, dialogue with parents, with the players themselves, with the administrators that you're working with, make sure that whether you diary or journal or whatever you wanna call it, reflect on it, think about it in your own head and kind of tuck those lessons away and use them for yourself and for others later on down the road. That's yeah. that's the big takeaway that I've I've had the last few years and and something I hope to to pass on to other coaches. Have you heard the big news? No Stress Midwest has found a new home at the soccer lot located downtown Kansas City. Swing by and check out our new training facility as well as our classroom will be hosting our tutoring sessions. Be sure to also check out our player lounge which includes a TV FIFA, ping pong, and the tech ball table for all of the needs of our trainees. Well, and, and that's big because I know when I started, um, I'm, I'm at my B license now with U.S. soccer, and it was like right at the C license. that I think that was like the first, I'd say, like major license that I had to take. And and a big thing in that was reflection. And same with the B is, you know, mm-hmm. we would do a session and then we'd have to sit and reflect on it. And, mm-hmm. and you touched on a good point. Did the players take away what you wanted them to take away from the session? And I think a lot of the times as coaches, we get so caught up in like, this is what it's supposed to do. This is how the players are going to respond and react, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And we don't even look to see if that's how the players are responding and reacting and learning or even yeah. asking them, Hey, you know, what, what was today's objective, you know, or you tell them the objective beforehand and can they say, yeah, yeah, I think we hit on that or no, you know, you're trying to do finishing and they say, Oh, I thought we were doing possession. Right. And then, right. you know, there's a disconnect there. So yeah. I think that that's huge and, and something that we don't do enough of, Maybe we're afraid to do it. Maybe it's Mm -hmm. too much work, Um, you know, but I think losing that like um, ego to you in a sense of reflecting and saying, hey, maybe that wasn't a good session. You know, maybe that was bad. I should have done better. I could have done better. And that's that's what you find when you reflect. Yes, it's hard work because it's just hard to find the time to do it. Yes. Because you need a 10, 15 minute window of quiet yep. to be able to think about how it started, what you said, what your mindset was like, all of those things. But then it's even more difficult when you're going through it to realize, shit, why did I say it that way? Yep. Or how could I have not seen this coming yep. with the way I was framing Everything, this? Yeah. Yep. It, yeah. it should have been obvious, you know, yeah. and now you look back on it and you go, man, it's so, and, and it's interesting. I, I have, over the last few years started to read a little bit about stoic philosophy mm-hmm. and they're big in ref- on reflection, but they're also big in, in studying and anticipation of the moment. So they will say you get up in the morning and you kind of reflect forward. What's the day going to bring? What meetings do I have? What demeanor do I have to take when I speak to this person versus speak to that person versus? Yeah. And it's funny because I haven't found a consistent time or mode to be able to do that yet. But I think that that would be so beneficial because I liken it to having been a player. I used imagery all the time. Yeah. Situations that would come up in games. Yeah. I would think about, yeah, this is how I'm going to handle that. Yep. And I've done it more recently as a coach as well, because when I was young, I was pretty explosive. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to run through those scenarios in my head so that when they happened on the pitch, I could stay calmer because in my mind, I've you already, already practiced yep. doing that. Now that works sometimes, but not all yep. the time. Right. But I'd like to actually take that practice and start to use that more consistently 
in preparation for my day and the meetings mm -hmm. and the session and everything that I have. I think for me, that's the next progression. But I think that that just takes that whole reflection idea and uses it to your benefit before. Yeah, you're doing you it. Anticipate. Yeah, I've never thought about that. And that's something that I do, you know, like every morning, you know, I wake up and when I'm brushing my teeth, I, you know, open up my calendar and I just look mm -hmm. yeah. I, or, or before I go to bed. All right. What, what do I have to go through tomorrow? You right. know? Um, right. So, so yeah, I, I, I get that. Um, well, well, let's kind of talk as you, you've, you've coached in, in every professional level here in the U S right. In the MLS and the USL, um, you were a head coach in both, um, League Two, Des Moines Menace, and in championship with OKC, an assistant with Sporting KC in Minnesota and in the first division, and now an assistant in League One. What has been, uh, I, I guess, not your reflections on it, but what have you enjoyed? What aspects of each role have you enjoyed, right? Obviously, there's some benefits to being an assistant versus being a head coach. Uh, the different leagues, I'm sure, have different and different coaches and staffs have, mm -hmm. you know, different things. So what how's that time been? What's what's been some takeaways from it? Teachers, we want you. Are you a licensed teacher in the Missouri or Kansas KC metro area looking to make a couple extra dollars tutoring over the weekday and weekends? Well, No Stress Midwest is the place for you. No Stress Midwest Education is looking for teachers to help in one-on-one -on -one tutoring, small group academic enrichment, and study hall. We are looking for teachers to work on average two to three nights a week, two hours a night, in the subject of language arts, science, math, social studies, and foreign language. If you're interested, please visit nostressmidwest.com slash education and fill out an application today. Cheers. The thing that's been the most consistent and that I've enjoyed about it the most, regardless of role, mm -hmm. um, and this is probably why I can take a number of different roles in any of the leagues and be happy, it's because the thing that's most important to me is the relationships with the, with the players and with the staff and with the fans, to be fair. Right. It's, they don't have to be your friends, the staff, the players, None of them need to be your friends, mm -hmm. but they do need to be people you can rely on and they need to be able to rely on you. And that's not an easy relationship to build when you first go into a club yeah. because people don't know you. They may know your reputation. They know, may know what's being said about you, but they don't know you. So yeah. they don't trust you. So to build that trust, especially with the players and the staff, takes a little bit of time. It also takes... Um, what's the word vulnerability i think mm -hmm. and to be able to put things out there about yourself where you've been unsuccessful as well as successful yeah and i have found in talking about some of those things the players can relate to that because they, they've all had crappy unsuccessful experiences as well not everybody has had a progression that's just been so linear and so right. positive the right. whole way through right it so doesn't work start, like that it doesn't work like that yeah. So when you start to have those discussions and build those relationships, you start to build trust. Then they start to come back to you with questions or concerns or ideas. And that's what I've enjoyed the most, that building process of a team. So when I say relationships, I'm not talking about a friendship. I'm talking about a relationship where we have a joint and mutual agreement to try to achieve something. Yep. We may not ultimately achieve it, but can we build a relationship that helps us move Get towards there. it right. and not a relationship that forces us away from it? Yeah. And we've all had those with yeah. players on the team or with yeah. staff or, or with those kinds of things. So the thing that's kept me going and I've, and I've enjoyed the most about it, and that's been the most similar from MLS to USL championship to league one to league two, high school, college, it didn't matter what the level was. It was about building those relationships so that ultimately we could trust each other and try to move towards our goal. Yeah. That's what I've really enjoyed. That's that for me is the most challenging part. The rest of it's the game and the game I've been involved with my whole life. It right. doesn't bore me, but it's the game. Yeah. All the dynamics of the relationships and mm -hmm. the teams, those are very different from group to group. Yeah. And that takes the effort to build and you do that 
before you ever build a good soccer team, in yeah. my opinion. Because people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Yep. Once they realize you care, then they'll open their ears a little bit and they'll open their hearts and a little bit to the it. way you want to play. Yeah. But if they don't think you care, then they could give a shit what you have to say about the game. Yeah. Yep. I don't know that that's right, but that's the experience that I've had in my lifetime as a coach that's led me to, to yeah. what I believe today. Well, and that's just human behavior, right? Like when, you know, being an entrepreneur, the one, one thing that people always say, hey, you know what you should do? And I'm like, dude, like you don't, you don't know enough about this to be able to, to be trying to tell me <laughs> something that I should be doing, right? And just like a player, if a coach is coming up to you and you don't know them at all. Now you got Frank Lampard telling you what to do, right? I'm going to say that most players are going to listen to that or an Andre Pirlo or something, right. even before they've coached, right? right? But players are going to, and I've seen that. They're like, yeah, well, what, what do you know? You know, and right. then it's, can you do it, right? You know, it's all these yeah. things that are going through their head. And, yeah. and until they can see, hey, you know, maybe the coach can't do all the stuff he's telling us, but I know what he's saying is correct. And how he's saying it to me is in a way that I can relate to versus like you have the coaches that are just like, get wide. So then now the players just get wide. And then there's times you're not supposed to get wide. Well, right. then they don't know when to do it because all they know is to get wide. Right. So yeah. it's, you know, you, I, it's a really good point that those relationships and the team chemistry and dynamic is so massive. And, yeah. you know, you get to a certain point where, whatever league you're in, all the teams and players are going to pretty much be the same, right? Correct. As far as technical ability way. and tactical, right? Yeah. But what changes is that chemistry, that yes. dynamic, when people can anticipate what the other person's going to do because yes. they've been playing with them for so long or because yeah. you work on it so much at training, right? Like that's the stuff that I think makes, makes great managers instead of just good coaches, you know? And that's what makes great teams is yeah. that group dynamic. Like you said, almost every team at every level has about the same resources and about the same level of talent. Mm -hmm. But what separates one team from the next this year, from last year and next year from this year, it's the group dynamic. It's the chemistry within that group. And have they bought into one another right. and their right. staff to be able to move forward in a positive direction. Right. So so we're getting ready to wrap things up here, uh, JP. As I was telling you earlier, I just saw that Zoom is, is they're really cracking down on these, uh, <laughs> on these calls here. Um, but what we kind of talked about advice that you wish you would have received and even some advice that you would give, right? Which as far as the reflection. Um, but let's just say for that one coach that is looking to maybe get their way into the professional game, kind of like how I was, when I, you know, just cold called you and, and then got mm -hmm. you on the podcast a few years later, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. advice are you giving that young coach that, that wants to make that jump? Maybe they're debating, do I sign up for the C license? Hey, honey, am I going to, like, I want to make this a profession, right? Mm -hmm. You've got a wife, you've got kids, you, you're dealing with all that. So what advice would you give that young coach that's listening, just trying to make that jump? Just to two important pieces of information. One of them, I think you touched on already. Go down the road of continuing education because the game changes from generation to generation. The kids change, the players change, their mentality changes, what's important to them changes. Mm -hmm. And you need to keep abreast of that. And along with that is make sure that you build or maintain your network. Don't be a selfish friend or colleague yeah. Be someone that's constantly reaching out. If someone does something that's unbelievable, then send out a quick text to them. Peter had his 500th game in MLS. I don't talk to Pete all that frequently anymore, but when mm -hmm. something positive like that comes up, I send a quick te text saying, hey, congratulations on, on 500 games in the league. That's fantastic. What an right. unbelievable achievement. And by the way, I remember when we were there for game one of yeah. yours. You know, yeah. um, I think those things are important because – you know, people will always say it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's really both mm. because you can know someone well and they can give you an opportunity. But in sports, especially professional sports, if you don't grasp that opportunity and you're not good at it and, su and successful at it very, very quickly, you're done. Yeah. So what you know matters, mm. who you know might get you in the door. But they're what not going to keep you there yeah, if yeah. you're not helping them win. Yeah. 
It's that simple. Yep. So you've yep. got to do both sides. You've got to make sure that you've got a little bit of a network that can help you get in the door, <clears> but you better be very, very good. And I would suggest that people continue as much as you can to get little tidbits of information. Go watch other coaches, go watch other teams, leave the country and get different perspective. Get as much info as you can. Use the bits and pieces that fit your personality and discard, mm -hmm. discard the ones that don't. But don't ever stop learning and trying to grow because the second you do that, the game will leave you behind. I love it. I love it. Well, JP, man, I want to thank you so much uh, for the chat, for the great, great advice. Um, you know, I, I do enjoy doing these podcasts because I get to learn new things about the guests, right? And although we, you know, we have spoken many of times before, just hearing a different side of it, right? It's And hearing new stories from you is always um as always fun uh so i want to thank you for for your being a guest um for those listening i want to thank you all for tuning in to another season to another episode of our podcast the no stress midwest podcast uh and cheers we'll chat to you later jp have a good one okay thanks brian appreciate the time yep cheers